Good morning and welcome to Rosemont Grace Brethren Church's online live stream Facebook message this morning. This is May 3rd, 2020. Um, glad that you joined us this morning. I'm going to go ahead and open us in prayer as we continue in our series of The Bible Doesn't Say That. I ask you to bow your heads with me. Uh, dear God, we need you. You know, we, we, we need you in our lives. We need you in these moments. God, I pray that you would uh, help us to, uh, you know, limit the distractions around us. And then even if there are distractions, God, I pray that you would be able to um, help us to focus on what you want this morning and what you're saying. And um, I pray, God, that, that I will be the mouthpiece for what your people need to hear and understand and know about you. I pray that people have a greater understanding of who you are and that they'll walk away from today's message being encouraged and understanding that we don't have to live the way that, that, that people around us are telling us to live, that we only need to live in the way that you tell us that we need to live, that we need to remember that we, that we are exactly who you say we are, that we're children of you, and that you love us, and you care for us, and you want what's best for us. I pray that we'll hold on to those truths today as we dive into your word. Thank you, God, for giving us Jesus, your son, and we pray it in his name. Amen. Okay, so this morning we are jumping into, back into our series. This is the last, we're closing this whole thing out. The Bible doesn't say that. And as you've, if you've noticed this whole time, there's kind of been a very similar theme with a lot of these, um, these sayings that, that, that people walk around and they say and they believe and they like to hold to. You know, uh, for instance, last week we talked about the idea that suffering always comes from sin or personal sin. We proved that that's not necessarily the case. And the, the, the passage that we looked at, you know, we, we talked about Job a little bit. These things happen in Job. And we just looked at what God does in different people's lives. And James counted all joy. You know, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to consider joy in my struggles, in my trials. Well, today we're going to carry a very similar theme. You know, last week was about suffering, and it was really kind of about, um, let's say, you know, our our pain levels, our, our uh, perspective issues. Um, so this morning, we're going to be jumping and we're going to be talking about this. So many people believe so often that if we're obedient in our lives, if we're obedient to what God says to do, that, hey, we're going to have financial blessings. So the phrase that we're going to look at today that's not in the Bible is this. Obedience always leads to financial blessings blessings. God does not say that in the Bible. God doesn't say, if you follow me, you're going to have the house, the car, the boat, everything that you want. That's not how it works. Well, um, have you ever, th so, I'm sorry, I'm a little bit off for a second, but as we, I want you to think about something. I want you to take a step back. I want you to think about your own life right now. And I, and I want you to ask yourself the question, do I struggle with this belief system? Do I struggle with a belief system that says, if I'm good, if I do what God says he's going to do, then everything in my life is going to go well, specifically when it comes to finances. Now, I want you to take, I, I, I want you for a moment to, to try to get to a place of honesty, brutal honesty in your heart and understand do you live by this mantra? Do, you, do we live by this? You know, I had to take a look at myself this week. Do I live? Do I act this way? Do I act like God is trying to give me financial blessing if I do what he says that, uh, that he wants me to do? Okay, well, so as we take the masks off, may, maybe think of it this way. Have you ever thought to yourself, I must not be a very good Christian because my car broke down this week and I don't have money to fix it? Or I, maybe there's something wrong, there's sin in my life, and so I've got my, my pension is, is crashing and burning right now. My 401k, my IRA, all that stuff. You know, the government is, is shutting things down, and I'm losing all kinds of funds. Is it because I have not been obedient to God? Have you ever connected your financial blessings or your troubles to your obedience or your disobedience to God? Believing that giving your life to Jesus will in some way have a positive impact on your bank account is exactly not what the Bible says. That is called the prosperity gospel. God doesn't say, if you follow me, 
I'm going to blow up your bank account. Those who buy into this are looking for a life of wealth. They're looking for a life of happiness. So many people raise their hand and say, yeah, I want Jesus if he'll give me what I want him to give me. When we live by this, and, and in times, like, this is why I want us to be honest, because there are times in our life that we do believe this, knowingly or unknowingly. We, we subconsciously walk around and act like that, that our actions are going to affect our, our finances, our blessings. This is the term that we use, our blessings. And the problem with this is we like to define our blessings by our terms. And the blessings are not supposed to be defined by our terms. They're supposed to be defined by God's terms. And so the motivation for a relationship with Jesus, it's all wrong. We don't, we don't get it. No, and, and I'm not saying that, that everyone who follows Jesus wants to be a millionaire. You know, that's not, that's not the case. But some people, they, they do believe that there is a correlation, and they take it a step further, and they subconsciously believe that if good things happen to people who are good, if, 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 I, if that person over there is wealthy and healthy and comfortable, because I see them following Jesus, and I see that other person who comes and strolls into church and sits in the back and, and wears the same outfit every week and smells funny and drives a broken down car, we like to take that and say, well, there must be something wrong in their life. But here's the thing. This is what I'm here to tell you today. This is not necessarily the case. We can't make broad statements like that. We can't make a broad statement and say that obedience leads to financial blessings because it's just not in the Bible. It's something called the prosperity gospel. And it's not true. And what this false gospel does is instead of giving hope to people to come to Christ, it actually casts doubt on their lives. Because they constantly walk around and wonder, God, am I, am, am I right with you? Because they're looking at the wrong things to, to, to find out if they're right. And because of this perspective sometimes, we forget... We look at what God can give us and we forget that God is the prize in himself. It's not about, we don't follow God because we say, God, I want you to give me this, give me this, give me that. We follow God because we want to get more of God. We want to be in a relationship with him and that, that should be our focus. That should be our motiva motivation. You know, it's, it's, I've heard it said before that we believe in a snack machine God. We walk up with our quarters, our gifts, our actions, our thoughts, and we, we put a quarter in the machine because we want God, the snack machine God, to drop a Snickers for us. And we think, well, if I'm putting this in, then I'm going to get out exactly which number I'm hitting. And see, that's a problem. You know, J.D. Greer said in his book, Gospel, he said, when we give to God primarily in order to get more from Him, we're not worshiping God. We're using Him. And so a question this morning that you may want to ask yourself, am I worshiping God? Am I following God? Or am I using God? Does my life look like a life that says I use God more than I want God? Do you see the difference? There's, there's, a, there's a, a perspective change here. Do you want things to feel secure in your life? Do you want them to feel complete? Do you want satisfaction? Do you want peace? Do you want comfort? Do you want contentment? How are you trying to find it? Are you looking for God to say, check off this list, God, and I'll be secure? God, build my account a little more, and I'll, I'll feel secure. God, give me that, that TV that I want, and I'll be content. God, give me that, that awesome food that I want, and I'll be happy. I'll be satisfied. You see, from a Christian perspective, our peace and contentment in any situation comes from trusting that God's in control. And that's kind of been the message this whole time. God is in control, and he knows what he's doing. So if you walk away with anything today, the Bible doesn't say that obedience will always lead to financial blessings. But what the Bible says is that our peace and our contempt, our, our con, I'm sorry, our peace and our contentment 
they come in a relationship with God. Specifically today, I'm going to talk about our peace and our contentment. They come in a perspective shift. You know, we're going to look at Philippians chapter 4. So I invite you to turn in your Bibles to Philippians chapter 4. We're going to be looking at verse 10 and on and on. But in Philippians 4, we see that Paul gives a message to the church in Philippi. And Paul is imprisoned in Rome during the time that he's writing this letter. You know, and, it, and so he wrote, he wrote this letter and he's trying to encourage this church that has supported him along the way at various times. And they've had their struggles, but he loves them and he's very, very happy in who they've been and what they've been doing. And so Paul writes this letter and he gets to the very end of the letter. And one, one pastor, I heard him refer to this section of the letter, Philippians 4.10 and on, as the PS section. The, the PS portion of Paul's letter it's right at the end, and he's trying to give them something encouraging and life-giving. But this P.S. doesn't stand for postscript. It stands for perspective shift. And that's what I want you guys to do today. I'm going to write this down. Perspective shift. Think, of, think about that in your, hand, in your head. Where in my life do I need a perspective shift? A P.S., Philippians 4, 10, and following. Where do I need a perspective shift? I really hope you can see this. Here's what the shift does for us. The shift points us to this truth. When the world says obedience leads to financial blessings, Following God will lead to good things happening in your life. We need to shift our perspective and understand that contentment is not found in self-sufficiency, but it's found in Christ's sufficiency. Jesus is sufficiency. Jesus is enough. If you take notes, write it down. Jesus is enough. There's nothing, we can't gain enough. We can't give away enough. There's nothing that we can do when it comes to gathering, attaining, and giving away stuff to find contentment. You know, we, we won't be content in, in trying to get this thing and that thing because we'll always want more. And so sometimes we try to give it away and we say, well, if I give enough away, then I'll be content after that. And that's not necessarily true either because the truth is we only find our contentment in Jesus. So I want you to drop your eyes to Philippians chapter 4, and I want to read with you. Philippians 4, verse 10 through 13. It says this. Paul writes, he says this. He says, I rejoiced greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for I've learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all things. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. You know, it's easy to see here with Paul's words in Philippians chapter 4. It's easy to, to trust that Paul means what he says when, he, when he's talking about being content. Because Paul is writing this letter from prison. Actually, he's, he's under house arrest in Rome. He's in a situation where he doesn't have control of, of where he's allowed to go and what he's allowed to do. He doesn't even have control over um, bringing in his own food and supplying his own clothes. And so what had to happen is the church in Philippi, the ones that he wrote this letter to, this is actually, he's writing a letter and he's sending it back with them with a guy named um, Epaphroditus. And this Epaphroditus guy was sent to Rome from Philippi. And he was sent there with a gift. He was sent there with some funds, with some money to help support Paul while he's under house arrest, to help support Paul in his struggles. And so Paul turns around and he writes this letter. And after this guy travels 800 miles and almost died to get, to get this money to Paul, he writes back. 
And Paul uses a special word here. He says, I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. This, this idea of renewal, it's, it's the same, it's a, a planting term or a gardening term. It's talking about um, a blossoming, a blossoming, a, a perennial blossoming. So it's this idea of, look, you guys in the church of Philippi, you have continually, you know, annually, yearly, whatever it is, there's always been something that's been coming from you, but there came a point, at some point you weren't able to give. And I'm so glad that you renewed that giving and you supported me in my, in my difficulties. They've acted again on their concern for him. And Paul says, at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. And this brings us to our first point in verse 11. Contentment is not connected to our circumstances. You see, this is where the perspective shift has to come in. My contentment, my happiness level, my joy level, all this stuff, it's not connected to my circumstances. We, we learned this last week a little bit in James chapter um, 1, but... Paul says, I'm not saying this. He's, he's not thanking them for the support that they gave him. I'm not saying this because I'm in need. Because I've learned to be content whatever the circumstances. Now, I, gotta, I wanted to show you guys today what, what I'm content in. Um, but I'm not sure if it's going to show up here on this camera. So we'll see. But I was given a gift yesterday. Yesterday was my birthday. And I had these awesome socks. And I don't know if you can see it, but it says, All I need is Jesus coffee, and a nap. Thank you, the Michael family. I think that's who, who got those socks for me for my birthday. But, you know, maybe my contentment lies in, in uh, coffee and a nap, you know. But, but the truth is, all I need is Jesus. And that's what Paul's saying here in this whole thing. He says, Con- contentment is not connected to my circumstances. He says, I know what it is to be in need. And I know what it is to have plenty. You see, here's the thing. If you don't know the story of Paul, Paul Paul had some struggles. See, here's the thing. Paul grew up learning everything there was to learn about the Bible. And he persecuted anybody who followed Jesus because he didn't believe in Jesus. And he was like the leader of the persecution. He had all the knowledge. He had the money. He he had everything he could he could need to continue to, to grow in his understanding of the Old Testament scriptures. But Jesus stopped him one day and said, look, why are you persecuting me? And he, ch- he shifted Paul's perspective. And then kind of after that, Paul went through a series of, of highs and lows and valleys. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, he writes this. He says, I have been in prison more frequently. I've been flogged more severely. I've been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews 40 lashes of a whip minus one. (laughs) Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. Remember, this is the same guy who says, I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. He says in verse 26, 2 Corinthians eleven twenty six. he says, I've been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false believers. I mean, that's a lot to read. He says in verse 27, he says, I've labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst, and have often gone without food. I have been cold and naked. See, this is the same guy who's writing this stuff. He's gone through these different situations. If Paul wasn't secure in his theology, he might feel ashamed for the way his Christian life has turned out. He's in prison. He turned his life around. He shifted his perspective and his focus on Jesus Christ. And it's like everything around him, his circumstances went went to junk after that. It's like he's doing exactly what Jesus wanted him to do, what God wants him to do in his life, and his bank account's failing. He can't even stay out of jail. He's shipwrecked. All these terrible things were happening to him. And this could have left him feeling inadequate and ashamed. But he says in Philippians 4.12, he says, I have learned the secret 
of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or want. How about you? Have you ever... Have you ever thought... I asked it earlier. I don't feel like a good Christian because of what's going on in my life right now, because of these circumstances around me. I don't feel like a good Christian because if I were a good Christian, wouldn't I have some of these blessings coming my way? Why do I have to struggle to put food on the table? Why can't I get that job that I really, I really want? Paul knew that his contentment was not based on himself or his circumstances. And we have to remember that too. So I want you to take a look at your life right now. And I want you to say to yourself, this life around me, these circumstances around me are not going to dictate my contentment level. As Christians, we won't be any more or less satisfied based on the possessions that we have, the stuff that we have. Because as I said earlier, when when we get something, we always want more. And I got to tell you, with me, I'm a tech guy. So I, I, I love the cell phones and the new technology. And every time I, I, I hold out to buy a, a cell phone, and I wait and I wait and, and I look to see when the next one's coming, because what I don't want to do is I don't want to buy a phone that, that in a month is going to be the old one. So I'm always waiting and, and I want to I figure out which one's going to be the best upgrade. But here's the truth. When I buy that phone, it's not three weeks later I see an article that says, hey, the next version, the better version is going to be out. And so I may be satisfied for like those three weeks and like, oh, this thing's awesome. I love this phone. This is great. But the second I read an article, there's just something in me that goes, hmm, I'm not quite as satisfied as I was three weeks ago. As Christians, we won't be any more or less satisfied based on our possessions. While we're waiting for that upgrade, we're thinking to ourselves, if I only had that thing, then I'll be satisfied, I'll be content. But here's the thing, the Rolling Stones had it right when they sang, I can't get no satisfaction. <laughs> they said, I can't get no satisfaction. I try and I try and I try, but I can't get no, I can't get no, I can't get no satisfaction. And it's true. No matter what, when we get that thing, that possession, that created thing, we will be left unsatisfied until we move on to the new thing for a short time. And then we're going to be left unsatisfied again. You know, Ecclesiastes 5.10 spoke of this. It says, whoever loves money never has enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with their income. This too is meaningless. And here's the problem. I talked about it. We need a perspective shift because if we're looking for contentment in the wrong thing, we are not going to find it. Prosperity won't satisfy our desire for happiness, our desire for wholeness, for completeness. If we're looking for joy, if we're looking for security, satisfaction, I can't get no satisfaction in the wrong things. And it'll set us on a journey that we'll never complete. Like, have you ever been in your car and you're driving and you're, in, in, and you get, you're using your GPS because we all use GPS. We can't get anywhere any, anymore without GPS. And you're driving along and all of a sudden the satellite goes out. And so the GPS loses the connection and it does this thing, recalculating, recalculating, recal recalculating. That's what happens in our life when we can't get no satisfaction. We're constantly driving. We're constantly on a journey that we'll be recalculating when we're lost. We're going to be out of range and we'll continue cycling back and forth. And we'll, we'll end up lost in the end and not be able to get to where we need to get. Because the problem is the GPS we're using, the thing that we're focusing on, the thing that our perspective is, is in tune with is not the right focus. And it's not working properly. 
So according to Paul, he says, do you want to find contentment? Do you want to find satisfaction? i got to tell you, it's not in your circumstances. He said, it's not in my circumstances. But what he does say is this. He says contentment, point number two. Contentment is learned. Contentment is learned. What did he say there in verse 11 and 12? He says, he says I'm, I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for I have learned to be content. In verse 12, he says, I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation. This is, okay, this, here's, here's the encouraging point, because up to this point, you're probably thinking, well, well Andrew, what are you talking about? You know, contentment, I get it. I, I can't get satisfaction. I'm looking for the wrong things all the time. Well, well, I can't just look one day and say, Jesus, I'm content in you. And, and, and Paul says this, basically the same thing, that he didn't just wake up one day and say, Jesus, I'm content in you. He says, I've learned contentment. We don't just wake up one day and understand what it means to be contentment, to be content. It's not ingrained in our minds. In these bodies, they're, they're racked by, a, by an insatiable desire for more. And here's the thing, that desire for more is a good thing, but we have to focus on the right thing to get more of. And so we've got to learn contentment. And once again, like the last few weeks, contentment comes with and is learned through a perspective shift. It's not about our circumstances. It's about the God in our circumstances. And we learn this when we lean on him in tough times. You know, as Bill Withers wrote, lean on me. Well, if we're running around and we're singing that song as if God's singing us, lean, lean on me. God is saying, lean on me. And the more times we heed those words, the more we'll experience contentment in him. We learn contentment as we navigate through the tough times when we've got nothing. I mean, it's, sometimes it's really nice not to have anything. Because it's in those moments that we, we drop to our knees and say, God, I need you. It's even harder at other times to, to find contentment when we've got everything we need around us. Or everything we think we need. So we've got to be careful. Well, just like Paul learned that we need to shift our perspective, we need to learn and believe that in all circumstances, Jesus Christ is enough. The way you do that is you remember, where has Jesus been enough for me? Well, in a general sense, Jesus' death on the cross was completely sufficient. It was more than enough to save us from our sin. And that, that, is, that is in a broad sense for humanity. But what about you personally? Where have you seen Jesus you know, come through? Have you ever had a situation where you, know, you didn't need something? There was a time that um, Katie and I were, were newly married and our washer broke. We didn't have the money to fix it. And you know, we had a, a little, our, no, it was our, our firstborn. And we had a baby. And of course, with baby, come, a, lot of, a lot of things need to be washed. And I didn't have any clue how we were going to get this washer fixed or how, what we were going to do to get a new one. And I was just talking to a friend of mine who was a pastor one day. And I said, hey, I, man, I'm struggling right now. I, I need prayer on this. And next thing you know, he calls you back an hour later and says, hey, I've got $300 here for you. Someone randomly gave me $300 after I got off the phone with you. It's those sort of memories that we've got to draw on because it's in those times that we, we hold on, that we learn contentment. God, you're going to supply my needs. You're going to define my needs. I just need to define my life and my perspective through you and what you want for me. You know, this passage, Philippians 4, 11 through 13, um, uh, Larry Osborne, a, a, a theologian, he, he wrote it this way. He said, he, he said, when God Abrahams me, when he blesses me beyond belief, I'll give him thanks and I'll enjoy it and I'll share it generously. And when he jobs me, thank <laughs> You know, when, he, when things are taken away from me, then I'll thank him, I'll trust him, and I'll enjoy my relationship with him. By God's grace, I know, how, I know both how to, how to abound. I can do all 
all of this through Christ who gives me strength. So even when God Abrahams us, when he blesses us beyond belief and, he's, and he gives us all sorts of finances and all sorts of uh, you know, land and wealth and family, we've still got to trust him. And we've got to be content in God, not in the things that he's given us. Because what could happen is God gave Job all sorts of things too. But in a heartbeat, all that stuff got taken away and Job was still content in God. And that brings us to our our last point. Contentment comes from a relationship with Jesus Christ. If you're listening to me today and you don't have a relationship, a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, you will not find contentment. You won't. You won't find it in your relationship with your wife or your husband. You won't find it in pouring everything that you've got into your kids. You won't find it in in going to work, you know, 60 hours a week and building that bank account. You're not going to find it in that food. You're not going to find it in in those items, those boats, those nothing. Contentment comes from a relationship with Jesus Christ. And Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all this through Christ who strengthens me. What's the secret of contentment that Paul said he learned? Paul says, I can live in every situation and circumstance that's mentioned above because my faith and my power and my strength comes in relationship with Jesus Christ. Paul says, I can do all this through him who strengthens me. So yeah, we... We may be able to find our power and our strength and our wisdom in Christ. But don't forget that we can find the power to be content in our relationship with Jesus Christ. Remember, contentment is learned and you can pray to God and ask him for contentment. Because you'll find it in him. And here's the thing, this verse so often it's misapplied. I... I, Every time you go into a gym, you may see somebody that has Philippians 4.13 written on their shirt. Or you see athletes, Philippians 4.13 written. They say, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You know, here's the thing. I can wear a shirt that says Philippians 4.13 on it all, all I want. I can believe it in my heart of hearts that I can do all things through Christ and it's not going to have me run a 4.3 on a 40-yard dash. It's not. It's not. I, I I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. It's not going to allow me to plow right through this wall because I have enough faith and believe God is going to give me the power in that moment to do it. That's not what this verse says. So if you you hear someone say, well, I've got this bad thing happening in my life, but I'm going to overcome it because I can do all things through Christ. That's not necessarily what he's talking about because what is Paul talking about in this context? He's talking about his possessions. He's talking about his life around him. He's talking about the things that are happening to him And he says, with all of this going on, with all of these circumstances that are all over the place going on, I can survive them. I can find my contentment in the midst of that in my relationship with Jesus Christ. Paul looks at the Philippians and he says, hey, pull in close here. I'm going to tell you the secret of how I got through so many ups and downs in my life. It's Jesus. That's the secret. That's it. Paul says, I I did it all through him and I'll continue to do these things through him. I I didn't give up and grumble. I didn't allow my circumstances or the people around me to rob my joy. To take away my peace. I also didn't get too high on myself when things were going well. Because I understand that my contentment is found in Jesus. Jesus Christ was and is enough for me. Paul says, look guys, when I've got it bad. Now friends, looking at your situation right now, you may be in a bad situation. We're not blind. We all have issues. Like I said last week, We may not all be suffering or struggling with the same thing, but we're all struggling with something right now. But the thing is, we don't need to focus on the thing that we're struggling through. 
We need to grab our perspective and shift it to Christ. Remember last week, fix, I will fix my eyes on Jesus Christ, who's the author and finisher of my faith. If Jesus is the goal, get this, if Jesus is the goal, contentment is the byproduct. If Jesus is your goal, if your goal is to, to, to get more of him and not to get more stuff, then happiness is going to come. Contentment is going to come. But you've got to want more of him. And if you miss this, it's not a matter of whether you've got a lot or a little. You're going to have problems. You, you know, think of it like driving a car. If you're driving, you're driving the car and... You know, a, a few, a, a, probably about six months ago, Katie was driving, and she was driving, um, and she was stopped at a red light with all four kids in the car, and had been sitting there for a few seconds, and then out of nowhere, she gets rear-ended by a guy who was probably going 30 miles an hour, and it totaled out the van. We think he was distracted because he was on a cell phone, because he was looking down at the phone, and when he looked up, boom, there was the van, there was the crash. Katie got rear-ended. If you don't focus on the right thing, which is Jesus in your life, you're going to crash into discontentment. You're going to crash. If you don't focus on the road when you're driving, you're going to crash into something. If you don't focus on Jesus when you're moving, and, and, then you're going to start looking at everything else and you're going to start playing the comparison game. I see what that guy's got over there. I may have just got this awesome new car that was new to me. It's a 2016. But my neighbor just rolled up with a 2021 model. I was content until I saw that and compared. If we're not focused on, wow, Jesus, thank you for supplying this need. I don't ever want to be content in the things that you give me. I just want to be content in you. If we, if we stay focused on that, then we don't have to worry about crashing into discontentment when we see our neighbor's new van or new toy. Living with this belief system that obedience always leads to financial blessing, it'll only set us up for failure. And then we become dis disinterested in this snack machine God because he's not giving us the Snickers that we want when we're putting the money in. And so what happens then? Well, we quit on God. And this has happened all across the world. People who buy into the prosperity gospel, when hard times come and they don't see the prosperity coming from giving their life to God, when their perspective is in the wrong place, they give up on God, they give up on church, they give up on what He says to do, on, on His expectations on, in their life. Because his commands aren't worth the payoff as far as they're concerned. He's not giving me what I want, so I don't want to give him what he wants, which is me, all of me. You know, living with this wrong perspective, it puts us on very thin ice and it puts us at risk of many things. You know, um, in 1929 when the stock market crashed, it produced tons and tons of suicides because people found their contentment in their finances. Same thing happened in 2008 with the economic crisis. There were suicides across the board because people's security and contentment was tied up into their finances. We have to be careful that our focus isn't on the the wrong thing. We've got to be focused on the right thing. Well, what's the wrap-up here? Well, Paul's wrap-up to this whole idea of contentment is this. He speaks of God's riches. I want you to drop your eyes down to verse 19. Philippians 4, 19. It says this. Paul, he's, he's finishing out this letter, and he looks, and he's, he's just talked about how awesome these, the, these Philippians are for you know, supplying his needs, but he's like, I didn't really need them anyway because God is supplying my needs, but but he used you anyway, and so that's great. And he says, and your offering is going to be an absolute amazing fragrance to him. And in verse 19, he says, and my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. 
Paul wraps up this whole idea of contentment and he points back to God and he talks about the riches of his glory. Well, what does God's riches amount to? Well, I think that to the God who spoke everything into existence, I'm going to take you back to fairy tale land for a minute here. Rumpelstiltskin ain't got nothing on God. Because God can make the straw and the gold. God's riches are infinite. It, if God made everything ex nihilo, if God made everything from nothing, then where can his riches possibly end? This is a point to the infinite resources of God's hand, at God's hands. Paul says, look, thank you for what you've done. And I know God is going to meet all your needs according to the riches of the glory. Because the thing is, he's got an endless supply. We may not have enough, but what, God, what can God do with two fish and five loaves? He can feed more than 5,000. What can God do when you're thirsty at a well? Jesus says, I'm the living water and, and, and it's never ending. And guess what? Do you struggle with this contentment? God says, I can meet all your needs according to the riches of my glory. He can help that too. All needs also includes the need or the ability to be content. There it is. When God does provide, when he's given you what you need to live for, then you do what verse 20 says. Paul turns around he thanks these people. He, he points around and he points the praise to God. He says, to our God and Father be glory forever and ever. If Paul, who's in prison at this time, when he's writing this, if he can shift his perspective away from his circumstances and towards God, and if he can praise God while he's in a prison cell, and wish for God to be glorified, then why can't we? Because here's the thing. We don't have it half as bad as Paul had it then. But we do have all the same tools at our disposal. We've got the same source. The one who should be our same focus. We've got to shift our focus to that source and when we walk through a world that's screaming that you need more and more and more and more we can look at the world and say I agree with you I do need more but I don't need more of what you're trying to sell I need more of Jesus Christ because in Jesus Christ I can do all this in Jesus Christ I can find my contentment Jesus is my source and I need more of him you, Jesus, I'm content. Will you bow your heads and pray with me? God, you're, you are the source of our strength, God. You're the source of our contentment. We've all come together today to, to get a greater glimpse of you as our Savior. I mean, that's what we're doing. People are listening. They're listening to what the Bible has to say. They're not listening to me. Well, I thank you, God, for being the source of our life, the, the source of our love, our laughter, our contentment. God, I thank you for your wonder, for your love and your kindness and your son. So it's with our hope and our futures tied to the same Jesus that, that Paul's talking about 2,000 years ago. It's, it's with our hope and our futures tied to the, to the name above all names that our confidence is in the great I am. And the fullness of our joy is in your presence and in your relationship with us, can I be content? I pray, God, that we'll devote our lives to you. I pray, God, that we'll seek you more and more and more and more. And I pray that your Holy Spirit will teach us what we need to learn and help us to remember how to be content in you. And I pray that he'll empower us to think in a way that's worthy as we walk out these doors, as we navigate our lives. Thank you, Jesus Christ, for being my source. I pray that I never get lost in a recalculating cycle. In Jesus' name, amen. Look forward to seeing you guys with us next week.
for Mother's Day. Have a good week.